my laptop. My, for some reason, the Wi-Fi just does not want to reach up here. It's yeah, uh, it's yeah. a real pain. <laughs> oh, oh well. All right, live on YouTube. Come on. All right, so right. Here we go. Well, yeah, very well timed. I think we just went live when you said that. Uh, hello, everybody on the YouTube stream. We will be getting live very shortly. Um, we did actually design a, a going live soon, uh, like placeholder thing. But being someone who is not the best when it comes to technology, Wait, have, I done, have I put that on the right? Speaking of not being really good at technology, oh, I have, yeah, it's on the right channel. I thought for a second it was um, on my YouTube channel for a second there. But it's thankfully on the Chronicles. So we'll get, we'll get going live very shortly into the actual show properly. Let's get the description up and then we'll get going. Content. Is that in? Get the thumbnail. Get to keep the thumbnail as well because it was a Red Bull win, even if it wasn't the Red Bull that we expected it to be, really. Or wanted. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Steve. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say there's a division here already. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted Paris to win. I want, yeah, I wanted to see it. It's someone different in the day, but it does kind of set the season up as being a Leclerc Verstappen battle. Verstappen, and we'll see how. How Netflix F's it up, but whatever. <laughs> Somehow yeah. Yuki Sonoda will win. Just to be clear, though, I want a Paris to win. Just to clear up any confusion. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people want Paris to win yeah. that one. Yeah. Right. So, He'll no. get it. He'll get it. Yeah. I mean, he got his first poll, which is something. First ever poll for mm. Mexican driver mm. as well, which is a surprise. I, I thought the Rodriguez brothers would have got one back in the day, but apparently not. Uh, but yes. Okay. So that is. All that. All right, take a sip of water. Are you guys ready to go? Yep, ready. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's record this bad boy. Sergio Perez claimed his first pole position in Formula One yesterday, but it was the world champion that fought back to take the win under the lights in Jeddah today. Hello and welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 182, where we're going to be reviewing the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix of 2022. I'm your host, George Housen, and joining me today is Steve Jackson from Formula Shakedown. Good morning from beyond the veil of broken webcams. <laughs> he is there, people. Don't worry. It's just an audio format today because webcam is not playing ball, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, uh, host of the Grip Strip podcast, Phil Matthew. Good evening, everybody. And Tom Downey from EF1. Good evening. So before we get into the show, I'm going to give a shout out to some people who have very kindly given us some five-star reviews to start out the 2022 season. We've got five-star reviews from uh, SoundyGit90, uh, Ronvers, and Darston Andy 71 Apologies if, if I've mispronounced uh, some of your names there, but thank you for that. Um, and yeah, if you guys want to get a shout out at the start of the show, you can do. Just give us a five star review on iTunes and we'll give you a shout out at the start of the show. And give us a five star review on Spotify if you listen on there as well. We can't give you a shout out because we can't see who gives reviews, unfortunately, but we really do appreciate every five star review on there. It's very much appreciated. Uh, so let's get into the race. Obviously, I mentioned in the intro there that Perez got his first po uh, pole position, but it was Max Verstappen who got the win today, Tom. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's fair to say today was a lot more mature drive from him. He he managed to get around the Claire after a few attempts. He got the job done. He came up from fourth on the grid to win. He got signs at the start. He got Perez through the pit stops and he got Leclerc on the track. So overall, a much much better day for the defending world champion. Yeah, um, Max showed a bit more maturity in his driving uh, today even compared to last week. Because um, you know, we saw what happened last week when, when he tried to lunge up the side of Leclerc and you know, he outbroke himself and then you know Leclerc came back and all the rest of it last week. We saw an initial sort of feat of that this week. And then I think it was Paul DeResta said on the commentary that Max needs to be behind 
the Clegg going through the final corner. So when they so when they come round the final corner, he's then got DRS again, but he's got a much longer straight to get ahead of him. Because on 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 the lap prior, you know, it was, it was lap what 42, 43, I think. Verstappen went round the Clegg going into the final turn, which gave the Clegg DRS and gave him that massive shove back up the straight, which is how he got back past him. But this time, I don't know whether Red Bull said something to him or whether Max realized it himself, but he held back he, and he just he just sort of kept tabs on Leclerc. And then he did him going into turn one or you know, a bit before turn one, go, going down the main straight. So we haven't seen that from Max before. And it's showing a different level of maturity that is coming into his driving. You know, obviously he's still got a long way to go, I think, with this sort of whole maturity and all the rest of it. But that's something that will come with time and with experience, with coaching and the rest of it. But yeah, it was it was a it, it was it was a good drive from him today. Did a really good start. Did signs at the start. Um, you know, signs had a good launch, but then almost got sort of left a bit exposed. So Max just did him into turn one, basically. Kept it clean. Didn't have to force anybody off this year. Um, and um, and and yeah, and then and then got lucky in the sense that he both he and, and, and Leclerc almost sort of fell into the positions they were in a bit because Perez got so unlucky with the timing of that of, of that crash, which obviously we'll get into later on. But um, but you but like like anything, you you play the hand that you are dealt, and Max did exactly that. He did what he needed to to get past Leclerc, and this week he made it stick and. Yeah, um, yeah, Leclerc was coming back at him, but he just held out to win the race by what four tenths, I think it was. But yeah, a, a good Sunday given he had by his standards, I'd say probably a disappointing Saturday. Yeah, Max Stappen definitely would have been uh, disappointed after qualifying yesterday. Only down in fourth while his teammate was able to stick it on pole. Uh, Verstappen, yeah, so he, he did he did a great job today. He really did, and you know, overtaking. Um, overtaking Leclerc like he did as well. And the other thing as well, Steve, I think a lot of Red Bull fans would have been very nervous before the start of this race, especially after Yuki Tsunoda retired and they had three retirements in Bahrain as well on top of that. But both Red Bull cars made it to the end of the race today and they did so fairly quickly as well. So a much better race for Verstappen and the team as a whole, really. Yeah, we had a bit more of a mixture of DNS today, which is uh, I'm not sure if that's reassuring or not. It's definitely a good a good, uh, a good day for for Red Bull Red Bull powertrains. Um, just obviously with Yuki going out, which is a shame because Yuki seems to have got a slightly more mature head on his shoulders this year. So it would have been good to see where he ended up. But um, yeah, it sounded like the uh, it was some sort of fuel pump or fuel return causing a vacuum in the fuel cell, which caused both Red Bulls to drop out last weekend. So they've obviously got gotten on top of that. I was just concerned about temperatures in general coming in here, which have had an effect on quite a few of the, you know, the, I think pretty much all our DNS besides Yuki were, besides the two Williams were uh, temperature related. So it's good that, well, that Red Bull have got a clear handle on that problem that they had and, I wouldn't expect that again, but um, yeah, uh, it was a bit, uh, it was a bit nerve wracking to watch considering what happened last weekend. Um, I was sort of half expecting I, one of those two at least to drop out again with some sort of related issue um, with this new fuel. Um, it runs it well, I wouldn't say it runs, it burns very hot, but it just, it just, it causes temperature build up in the car and a bit of heat soak. So um, yeah, Red Bull have obviously dodged that bullet today, um, but yeah, it's we're only two races in, so I'd expect a few more sort of hiccups for I think everyone just with new fuel and new regulations. Packaging on these cars is incredibly tight as well, especially if you're running a Mercedes power plant. So, um, yeah, Red Bull got I wouldn't say got lucky, I think they just got a really good handle on that issue and just nipped it in the bud before it became a real problem. But, um, yeah, like I said, we're two races in, so let's see. Yeah, very early days indeed for Red Bull powertrains. They're only their second race um, and a much better one reliability-wise. They've still got a ways to go, of course. And it, it's how they also go on throughout the whole season as well, how they maintain that kind of a, a kind of pace. And it, on pace, at least, though, they do look very quick. And, you know, it does. It, it's early days, of course, Phil. There's a long, long way to go, of course. But it does really seem as though it's going to be a Verstappen versus Charles Leclerc battle for the championship this season. Just less than six tenths between them today. And it was an incredible battle. I mean, 
we, we've mel- we mentioned how the DRS down the pitch straight has been has been so crucial, and seeing them both slow into an absolute crawl, <laughs> locking the tires up just to avoid giving the other DRS. You know, some people might think that's a bit gimmicky, and it makes you know means that the DRS is quite powerful. But I love seeing stuff like that. I love the tactical battle at two hundred miles an hour. It's fantastic to see. Yeah, and it's a good, and the two of them seem as as for now to respect each other george and it's it's good uh positive battle at least early on in this season and it's something where when you consider a lot of the stuff that's been going on this weekend um outside of the actual race itself um being able to focus on this head-to-head battle and what seems to be the likely scenario for the majority of the season these two guys who are the next generation of Formula One, Ferrari, of course, believing in Charles Leclerc for so many years and finally giving him a car that he can compete with. And, of course, the defending world champion in Verstappen, who is the guy there and is going to be the guy there for the long term. It's positive to see you also have Signs, who's just a little bit behind, but is trying to bring himself up there in Perez, who... Uh, had the pace today and and or had the pace yesterday didn't turn out so well with the, how everything uh, landed cautions wise but it's a two team battle seemingly what it's been for many years but it's Ferrari instead of Mercedes and it's something that we'll uh, be able to look forward to I think as we go along I mean I don't really foresee much of an adjustment for a while it may be probably may before um, we see any real challenge on the mercedes side um, unless they are able to do something within the cost gap and adjustments so it's going to be a battle between these two guys and what what will happen how will they drive each other will it devolve into what it ended up being last year or will they respect each other through the entire season and we'll have a pretty straightforward fight as it stands, Leclerc, of course, has the points lead by 17 or 18. I didn't get to look at the points. Uh, but um, we're only two races into a 23-race season. Of course, you're going to take – we're talking about engine situations and the fuel and probably grid penalties that are going to be coming up. But as it stands right now, we're not at that point yet, so we'll let's let it lie and see how everything goes. But it's cool to see a good battle amongst the two drivers that I guess are the two top drivers right now um, in Formula One. Yeah, it's great to see them having a fight. Like like you said, it's you know it's the real future of the of the series of these two guys. You know, we've we've they've been earmarked for a long time to be you know future world champions. One of them is already a world champion, and the other one is at the top of the standings. And yeah, it's a twenty point gap between Leclerc and Verstappen. But in between those two, on thirty three, uh, twelve points back from Charles Leclerc is Leclerc's teammate Carlos Sainz, who finished third place again today. Tom, I mean, it's at very early days, but it does seem as though he's going to be a very consistent driver again this year. He's always he's going to be a there or thereabouts on the podium. It's another solid drive for him today. Um, he ended up getting the place back from Perez uh, through the pit stops um, because of the race director telling him to, to get out of the way or he'll get a penalty. But still, third place, another solid day for the smooth operator. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, again, super impressive day from science today. Um, and yeah, okay, he got done a bit by Verstappen at the start, but he did have a good initial launch. You know, it's not like he bogged down at the start and you know sort of rolled into anti stall or anything. You know, he, he 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 moved well off the line, but it was just uh, it was just unfortunate that because Max got such a good launch, you know, obviously he didn't you know signs didn't like contacts, and you know, maybe he left the door open a fraction too much by the by, and you know, you know Max just went well, thanks by and. Off he went into third, but yeah, you know, good, good solid drive was never really under threat from whoever was in fourth, at, uh, you know, um, uh, well, whoever was in fifth at that time, who was behind him then, was it? It was the Alpines, wasn't it? It was Ocon and Alonso, you know, they were too busy fighting with each other to notice what was going on in front. Um, so, you know, so, so he, he kept pace with them, um, with the top three. Drove a good race, you know, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't do anything wrong. Um, then a little bit fortuitous with the pit stop 
Um, but it was, you know, again, it's so much of per- um, Perez's misfortune that he got to where he was. But, you know, he, he, he held out at, at the end. He was right that Perez did, didn't squeeze him, but Sainz was ahead at the safety car line. Um, you know, so, so Perez gave him the position back. He held out. He did well. He held his position. Drove a good race, picked up good points for the team. Um, and yeah, I think he's looking really strong in that Ferrari. I also think he possibly has possibly played a bit of a blinder when he signed for Ferrari back in 2020 because when when that deal was announced, and obviously we saw how woeful Ferrari were in 2020, a lot of us were going, Oh, oh you know, he's going to Ferrari. Oh my god, why are you doing that? It reminds me a bit of when Hamilton went to Mercedes in 2013. And people were saying, oh, why have you done that? Blah, blah, blah. They have a new set of regulations and hello. So, uh, you know, it's, um, you know it, initially it's working out for him. And last year there were promising signs coming through. Um, you know, a couple of podiums, you, you, know, start, you know, almost had pole in Russia. Um, and, and yeah, he, he, it's not like he's driving in Leclerc's shadow. He is there on merit and he is putting in good results you know, both Sunday so far. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more of him this season. Yeah, me too. He's, it's his first time in a car that's a real championship challenger. I'll be very fascinated to see how he gets on. And like, and like you said as well, you know, it, it was one of their moves at the time that was a bit like, why are you going there? McLaren and the, the team in the ascendancy. But as it turns out, Ferrari are now the team in the ascendancy. And uh, McLaren, although they did do better this weekend, are not anywhere near that really. Um and nobody's really close to Ferrari in the Christophe's Championship. Again, very early days, only two rounds in out of 23, but it's a 40-point gap back to Mercedes. And Mercedes is just a point ahead of Red Bull Racing after uh, after this weekend. Um, but we'll get on to the second Red Bull driver now, um, Sergio Perez. And, you know, you might you might think looking at it that he, you know, he, he made a mistake, he threw, threw it away or made a bad start, you know, or something like that, the reason why he didn't end up even getting on the podium in this race, Steve. But... It turns out it's just he was just plain unlucky. He was the first driver of the leaders to stop. And then an accident, I think it was a Latifi crashed into the wall. And then everybody stops on the safety car and they all get the advantage and they all jump in him. And he ends up finishing fourth in the end and through no, no fault of his own, really. Yeah, I mean, in a vacuum, it doesn't look like a particularly good result, but it's just like, <laughs> I can't think of a driver in recent race history who's done everything right but ended up at the wrong you know you know ended up in the wrong place basically um i mean red uh, ferrari did pull something it wasn't cheeky but it's just as usual pit lane tactics with um you know seemingly getting ready to bring um bring ferrari in early um but uh it, they they took the bait um and and pulled pulled Chico in um and it sort of it left him on the back foot you know, from that point forward, we had a um, safety car period afterwards. Um, and like, just uh, like from there, it just started going a wee bit backwards. I don't think the pit lane exit sort of scuffle with, I wouldn't even call it a scuffle, but the, uh, just the, the, you know, meeting signs coming out of the pit, pit exit at the same time was intentional or malicious at all. I mean, he's, he's sort of looking the opposite way of where the pit lane exit is. He's looking in towards the apex of turn two um you know he can't he can't be looking in two different directions at once and you know it's quite normal for a car to run wide there because that's that's the racing line um even though they were under a, a under yellow um they still push as hard as they can even under yellow to keep you know to keep temperatures up and just keep the rhythm going as best they can so i i didn't see anything malicious with it i think science was well within his rights to point that out and you know make sure that the racing was fair and it was um i, I mean if Checo's upset about that i don't imagine he is but you know like that's that's just the way it is but um like up, well up until that point i mean i think he led for the first 15 16 laps or so i couldn't see anyone getting near him he just had full control of that race um so it's just a shame he's uh he's ended up where he is it's it's more of a shame that it's not his fault i think it's more frustrating to be a professional athlete knowing that you've done everything you can but it's still not been enough um and it's just the way it is sometimes i mean i i don't th- i can't i can't point at a single thing that he's done wrong in this race so that that win will come 
Um, like he's got his first pole now with Red Bull. He's won a race before. I mean, he won a, the, the race he won, he won from the back. He's done amazing things. Um, and with the way these tires sort of work now, like they don't drop off a cliff like they used to, but they take a long time to get up to temperature. And we know what Chico's like on sketchy tires. He's, he's good. So he's probably one of the better position drivers to, or better equipped drivers with these new regulations to capitalize on the fact that these cars produce far less grip in low and medium speed corners. So when we get to circuits like, um, you know, like Catalonia or Monaco, well, maybe not Monaco, it'll be a bit of a procession, I think still, but when we get to those um, sort of, you know, more technical circuits, um, where there is plenty more low and mid speed, um, I think Chico will come and get there. And I, I think we'll see some pretty incredible things from him. It'll come. It'll definitely come. I, th- I think for Perez as well, I mean, it's impossible to say how he would have got on for the following 35 or so laps had there not been a safety car then, it, you know, but at the end of the day, you're right, Steve, he, he was clear, he was he was comfortable, he, he kept the he kept Leclerc, I think it was, he was in second at arm's length, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure who had the fastest car this weekend, I think Red Bull maybe just had the faster car this weekend but not by a lot but yeah Perez was you know he he was comfortable and he's really really unfortunate to finish fourth but you know you get some bad luck and you get some good luck hopefully you get some good luck soon and um and be able to challenge for another win sometime soon um now a driver that won't be challenging for a win soon will is George Russell unfortunately but that's not from like a try and fill I mean you know again fifth place today it's the best he could have hoped for. He did a great job in qualifying, I think, because you know we all saw how much Lewis Hamilton struggled in qualifying. He was down in 16. Russell was sixth. You know, Russell kept his nose clean. He was in, he got past the, I think it was, uh, I think it was no, it was it was Ocon, Espen Ocon he got past. And once once he was clear of him, he was clear of the midfield and relatively comfortable in fifth. Yeah, I mean, there it's it kind of went the same way last week. George with the Mercedes, they were in their own little world and George maximized his qualifying run and was in his own little world again. And it's fifth place is the best that it's going to be unless something happens with the, either of the other teams. Uh, we saw that last week, the RBPT uh, cars uh, in the main team both fell out. That's the reason why they finished third and fourth. In this case, fifth was the best that Mercedes was going to be able to do this weekend the one thing I'll say is after last week's qualifying and uh, off like an off day for George, because I read Mr. Saturday is as Crofty always likes to say. The fact of the matter is uh, off day for him came back this week was strong. They set up on his side of the garage was was a good setup for that car on, on low tanks. And he was able to get the most out of whatever they were going to have. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there in Brackley, and they're going to have to really grind uh, to make anything of this season uh, past being third in the constructors, which for a lot of people probably brings joy. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, you want more competitiveness. And it's a two pronged issue for Mercedes. It's not just the fact that their car is a lot of drag and porpoises more than any other car seemingly. It's the fact that the power unit is also not as good as it has been over recent years. And you're not going to correct all of that during the season. So uh, we will see what happens, I guess. But for George, solid, solid qualifying, solid race. Um one of these days he will win. I'm not sure when, but he will win a race and it'll be a great thing, but um, it's going to be a while until uh, uh, they're able to be on the same level of Ferrari and Red Bull. Yeah. Mercedes still, still some way off, uh, off the top two teams. Uh, they'll be back. I'm sure just with their history and everything, how they performed and George Russell to his credit, he's doing everything that they could ask for him. He's solid. He's consistent. He's keeping the car on the track. You know, he's doing absolutely everything they could ask for the ask for the kid. And he's got a very bright future in Formula One. He will be the lead driver in that team when uh, when Sir Lewis Hamilton eventually decides to retire. Um now, next up we've got Esteban Ocon. He finished in sixth place for Alpine. A solid finish, a good amount of points for him today. Alpine looked pretty damn quick today. Alonso, before he retired, was was well up there. 
Um, but the rest of his question mark around, around knock on at the moment would be is uh, is defending against his teammate Tom, which was pretty borderline, but still he made it he made it count in the end, got through to sixth place. He just just finished ahead of Lando Norris in seventh. Yeah, I kind of had a right ding dong with uh, with Alonso today. And I wonder if what Mars Safnau was getting like PTSD from seeing Ocon in a pink car fighting with his teammate. Um, you know, so last time I saw that, it you know it didn't end well in Spa, but nearly had an airplane accident. Um, but no, yeah, um, the opening surprised me because I thought they're going to be a bit gash this year, to be honest. But you know, they both had good qualifying, obviously. You know, to start where they started, and they both had good races. Um, you know, uh, Alonso was on for my driver of the day before his car. Basically, shit the bed. Um, so uh, you know, so but um, but Ocon as well, you know, was was having a good race. He was he was having a good scrap with his teammate. Who it's one thing to fight with your teammate. It's another thing to fight with your teammate, who's a two time world champion in Fernando Alonso. Um, and Alonso was getting his elbows out. You know, he was wiggling. You know, you know, it was like he was mimicking the poor poison with his car going down the main straight at one point when Ocon was, was sort of coming at him, you know, almost sort of forcing Ocon to commit to a breaking zone, which he did. And then he was sadly went a bit wide, which then left him susceptible to Bottas behind him. Um, but yeah, uh, he, you know, he was, he was having a good race and you know, he was putting in some good moves, some good defensive moves. He got very close. I thought he'd squeeze Fernando into the, almost into the wall at one point, um, which I think is why... Um, uh, you know, which 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 is why um, perhaps Alonso got got his elbows out even a bit more in you know on the um, on on the uh, on the, the second time round, but he was but he, he was he was doing well, and it, it would be easy for a driver to sort of come in and go, oh my god, wow, Fernando, hello, how are you? I'm such a big fan, and then sort of let them steamroll him. But Ocon's come in and said, Nahan, I'm here. You know, I'm not just going to roll over because this is the third time you've raced for the Endstone outfit and blah blah blah. Um, you know, no, Arcos gone in there and said, you know, if you if you want this place, you have to get it. If you're going to if you want to overtake me, you have to work for it, teammate or not. We're having a ding dong, son, and that was exactly what they did. Ultimately, Lonzo came out on heads before uh, before his. Um, before his Renault power unit channeled its inner Mercedes um, and blew up, but um, or whatever it did, um, but yeah, it was uh, Oc- Ocon was impressive, and again, you know, much like the race last year, you know, he was he was having a drag race to the finish with um, you know, with a uh, with um, with a Mercedes power car. Obviously, this year it was Lando and and Ocon held out as opposed to just getting picked because last year it was Bottas. I think we just picked into a podium position. Um, but yeah, but Ocon, all in all, did really well. Um, bearing in mind, he hasn't got the sort of heaps of experience that someone like Alonso has, and he'll have learned stuff from today as well. So, so you know, so hopefully he'll see sort of the way Fernando was defending or the rest of it, and he can begin to incorporate that in, into his driving. But he's looking good. I've got to be honest, because, because I think it was, I think he's getting to the point where it's almost sort of make or break for him, because he's sort of been sort of middling around that sort of midfield for a while. Um, you know, obviously he used to have ties to Mercedes, which seem to have gone, um, you know, because they've put all their eggs into George Russell, or soon at the moment anyway. Uh, so, yeah, so Ocon almost needs a strong year and he's got off to the right start, certainly this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ocon, he's a real dark horse, you know. He's not a guy that a lot of people would have, you know, fancied really to beat Alonso. I, I definitely would have done. He showed flashes of brilliance, you know, um, last year. Obviously, with his win, he nearly got a podium at Saudi Arabia last year as well. Uh, and and today he was very good as well. And a lot the pressure the pressure is on Alonso. I mean, Alonso is saying that he wants a car that's able to, you know, fight for a world championship and everything. But at the end of the day, so far, early days of course, so far he's been beaten by his teammate. So he's got he's got to perform at the end of the day. So it'd be interesting to see how that kind of that battle flares up because on track today they were they were leaving nothing. They were not taking prisoners. <laughs> you know they were really fighting for it. So we'll see how this uh, battle kind of evolves through the year with Alpine. Um, 
Uh, on the positives as well, I mentioned him there, uh, Lando Norris, he got seventh place today for McLaren. Steve, it's great to see this. It really is because McLaren, after VAR8, I think a lot of us were getting 2017 flashbacks, but it doesn't seem quite that bad. They got a lot more on the top of the car today. Obviously, Daniel Ricciardo's retirement is not very encouraging, but he was up there with Norris during most of this race. So on pure pace, at least, it's looking a lot better for McLaren. Yeah, I think they're uh, probably at the other side of where they want to be in terms of that sort of, you know, um, that that top 10 anyway. I think, like, given the trajectory they've been on for the last couple of years at least, you'd expect them to be a wee bit higher up, but that is a bit better um, compared to Bahrain, which was, I mean, yeah, we know what happens, and I won't talk about that considering I am a bit of a McLaren fan. Um, But no, uh, loads better. Um, I mean, Lando was pretty conspicuous by his absence but normally when the cameras aren't focusing on a driver they're either they've either just got their head down and they're doing their job or they've been it or the you know car's blown up or something so um yeah it's a, a you know a perfectly fine race i mean that that's valuable points for mclaren now considering you know um the start that they've had so um yeah, I think they'll just take what they can get. But yeah, seventh place is good. Danny Rick was looking like he was on for a top 10 finish. Um, sounded like it was, um, I mean, all the DNFs that weren't accidents were all overheating. So um, I think, it, it, like I said earlier, it was probably just teams running the, you know, the cooling side of things a wee bit too fine, maybe. Um, but obviously that issue didn't really plague Lando. Um, he, he he seemed pretty uh, pretty comfortable throughout the entire race. So I don't think there was anything um, sort of too untoward going on or, you know, any, any sort of particular area he was struggling. Um, I did kind of want another lap um, at the end with him and uh, Esteban Ocon just to see how that would have played out because that was starting to get quite spicy. But he definitely had a run on him. But, um, yeah, I think just coming out of the final corner, Esteban Ocon um, just sort of positioned the car in a place where um, Lando couldn't quite get onto the power without sort of risking sort of, you know, just just looping the car basically so um clever clever race, race craft from uh, from ocon to keep him behind but um yeah the, the the mclaren looked reasonably quick i mean the alpine was fast this weekend so the fact that he was actually able to you know confidently pull up alongside him um it, it says less to me that it's a power train that, that it's a that it's a power plant issue that mclaren are having um and more that it might just be a bit of an aerodynamic issue um but yeah, again, but I, th- I think this will be the theme for the next couple of races. It's still very early in the season, but um, yeah, like I'd be more keen to see how they're performing later on in the year once we start seeing some, especially some aerodynamic convergence. Um, I think teams will be very keen, especially to look at what Ferrari and Red Bull are doing um, and try and not not copy it, but but you know bring in their own interpretation of what those two teams who are clearly miles ahead of doing um and mclaren are very good at you know introducing new parts taking a bit of a risk we've seen it before i think midway through 2020 they introduced a fairly drastic aerodynamic update which sort of put them on the back foot for a couple of races but um in the long term that that paid off for them so i don't think they'd be that desperate to try and just you know to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it just yet but if the performance gains that they're seeking aren't quite coming um i think we'll see a very different looking McLaren in the next few races which I'd be quite I'd be quite interested to see what they do because at the moment I'm still a bit unsure about that car in general but um yeah if anyone can like drive around a problem I think it'd be Lando Norris he's he's one of the best at just sort of getting everything out of a car even on a bad day yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a hell of a driver, and today he proved it. I don't think the McLaren was was faster than the Alpine. I don't think it was faster than the Haas. I don't think it was faster than the Alpha Tauri. But Norris was right in that group and almost got to the head of it. So you know, fair play to the kid. He's he's a hell of a talent, as we've seen a lot um, during <laughs> during the last few years or so. He really can get the best out of that McLaren. Uh, and likewise, Pierre Gasly, he can always get the best out of his Alpha Tauri at eighth place today. Uh, obviously, a benefit, I think, from um, from some of the guys ahead of him retiring, but still got points on a weekend where I don't think we we're really expecting too much from, from Alpha Tauri, Tom. But, you know, four points on the boards, I think that's the best he could have really done today. Sorry, computer had a moment. Um, yeah. Uh... <laughs> 
I wondered almost at one point if Gazzy had an issue because he seemed to just be falling back a bit through the grid. Um, I did feel for him because he, he looked like he was just just wasn't having the best of times out there today, unfortunately. Um, but no, he was a uh, yeah. It was almost I don't want to say damage limitation because it, it's not like they actively came into the. Um, it's not like they actively came into the weekend with a sort of fundamental issue that we know about. Um, obviously, seeing Sonoda conk out before he even started, you know, might be, well, may well have been playing on the back of his mind a bit, thinking, oh, you know, is my car going to do the same thing or the rest of it, especially given he had an electrical issue last week. Um, but um, but no, he was a... Uh, he at least, at least he got some points for the team. Um you know, it did seem like it did seem like at one point that a couple of drivers were sort of just driving past him as if they were you know, overtaking him on the M4 or something. But uh, uh, but yeah, um, no, interesting point which Steve has just said. Guys was apparently having incredible intestinal pain, um, and quote unquote uh, said he felt like he was dying in the car. That's not good, um, and. And you know, given the sort of like pressures these guys are under when they're driving, you know, the you know, the, the G forces and obviously being you know, strapped in and all the rest of it, you know, if you think about if you think about sort of like how a sort of everyday person, such as us gentlemen, or you know, you know, anybody listening, if you think about sort of like if you're ill, um, how it can sort of you know, how so you it'll make you a bit sort of brain fogged or something. It's like I've got quite bad hay fever at the moment. Um, you know, sometimes it leaves me feeling sort of, you know, sort of like a bit, a bit sort of like cloud headed. Imagine if you're trying to drive a Formula One car whilst feeling like your insides are trying to eat themselves alive. Um, you know, it, you know, on one of the most demanding circuits as well. You know, it's not like he's, it's not like driving around Monza or something, which he's, you know, or a circuit which he's super familiar with. It's hot. It's a night race. You know, it, it's a very, very physically and mentally demanding circuit. So, I di- I didn't know that about Gazi in in the uh, in in the race. Um, I'm glad to point that out, Steve. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so uh, kudos for him. Sorry, kudos to him for carrying on, even when he was in that amount of pain. You know, it sounds like he may well have a sort of virus or infection. Or let's not mention viruses, actually. Um, but you know, you know, it, you know, it, it, it sounds like you know he, he might he might be ill or almost certainly had kind of food poisoning or something, who knows? Um, you know, so first of all, I hope he feels better soon. Um, and there's nothing too serious. Um, but yeah, but you know, kudos to him for cracking on when he was obviously in considerable pain. Yeah, that's a, that's a ridiculous thing that for him to to go to go out and actually perform as well as he did with with that. I mean. You know, a lot of us when we have a bad cold and we feel like that, you know, we just want to, we just want to chill in bed and just, you know, have, you know, just, but he's going out in the middle of the night in Saudi Arabia where it's really hot and basically being chucked around for two hours in a Formula One car. You know, I, I don't know how these guys do it. I really don't. I'm absolutely in awe of them um, to do things like that. That's that's incredible. So fair play for you guys. Like, hope you're better soon. Hope you don't have to do that again for Australia in two weeks' time. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on to Kevin Magnussen next, ninth place. Um, again, I mean, he was he was up there with uh, Lewis Hamilton. He ended up finishing right above Lewis Hamilton in the end. Phil, it, it could have been a bit better for him. I think maybe he, you know, he just he, he tried sticking his car out as long as possible on the hard tires, like Hamilton did. It didn't quite work out for him in the end, but still ninth, two points on the board for Haas. Not a bad weekend. Yeah, considering where they were this time last year to have a guy (laughs) who's as happy to be there as Kevin Magnuson is and the positive energy that he brings to this organization as somebody who's been there a long time knows a lot of the people there and adding to the fact that of course with Mick's situation yesterday to go and maximize your situation only being able to run with one car and get a couple of points yeah I think he wanted sixth just like the guy we're going to talk about here in a moment uh, would have wanted or thought he could have had even after the nightmare scenario um, from yesterday. The 
the Haas team, this is, you're taking advantage of the fact that the Ferrari power unit is much better this year. You're taking advantage of the fact that you've made a really good car. And, and all these things combined, and a driver who's, who's very happy, just, I mean, I, I mean, Kevin Magnuson, I, I never really, you never really um, knew much um, uh, about him or we didn't get as much out, out of him um, in recent years. But now I think there's just a genuine joy he has for racing um, in this, in Formula One. And it's a good thing to see. And it's something that um, for Haas, as they're trying to build upon uh, after the last few years of being out in the out in the wilderness to actually be back and have to compete in the midfield, it's a good thing. Yeah, they probably wanted more, but considering where they were this time last year, getting two points is a great thing. So perspective is there. Australia is a track where, of course, Kevin Magnussen has scored a podium before. Um, I mean, I I think he scored the podium and then he had a penalty or something, something like that, whatever. His first, one of his, I think his first race with McLaren, actually, his first race in Formula One. So the fact of the matter is it's good vibes there. See what they can do. Tighter circuit compared to the last two circuits. We'll see what uh, Haas has with the higher downforce uh, here in two weeks' time. Yeah, I think it speaks volumes of the fact that, you know, Magnussen getting two points for Haas today is, is in a way a disappointment. Uh, you know, <laughs> last year that would have been like you know them celebrating and uh, um, you know unbelievable scenes like what we had in Bahrain uh, last week as well. So, yeah, not a bad weekend for him by any means. Could have got more, could have got less, but you know it's uh, it's not a disaster by any means. And like you say as well, you know uh, Australia is a track, although it has changed this year, it has changed its layout from what it was three years ago when we last raced there. It is a track that Magnussen does well out there. He got second there. Uh, on his debut, I remember, well, third on the track, but he was second after Ricardo got disqualified. I think that's what you're referring to. And obviously Haas were extremely quick in 2018, I want to say, before the wheels literally fell off their wagon. But let's not bring back those bad memories for them. Um, but I tell you what, there'll be a lot of bad memories this weekend for Sir Lewis Hamilton, Steve. Tenth place, he got a point. Um, I mean, you can look at it cynically and say the only guys that, he, that finished behind him were someone who had two penalties, a stand-in, and a guy who crashed. Um, it's it's really not good reading. He was unlucky in the sense that the pit lane entry was closed when he could have gone in under VSC and he would have finished in sixth and it would have been a good race. But still, I, I can't help but feel, especially after qualifying, that there's a lot of problems in that Mercedes car that he's not able to get on top of, at least around Jeddah anyway. Where's that meme of uh, Nico Hulkenberg with the uh, explosion behind him just saying as Lewis Hamilton's career over? Um, no, I don't think it's that bad. Um, it, uh, again, same as Lando, is very conspicuous by his absence. That's a, that's a weird thing to say about Lewis as well because he's normally, I mean, he's normally a minute up the road from anyone else, um, you know, by the time the race is, in, uh, race is over. Um I'm not sure. I, I, I honestly don't know what to make of the situation. I didn't expect it. Um, I mean, on one hand, Lewis is quite comfortable and very, very happy to throw around an incredibly high grip car all day long. These cars under their new regulation still produce a lot of downforce, but it's quite different. They move around a lot more and at low speed, they are basically an 800 kilogram go-kart. Um, they are incredibly heavy and just, quite cumbersome and i don't know if it's a case of just the general sort of performance quirks of the car changing so drastically from last year of throwing him off a bit he was obviously struggling a lot in qualifying to even you know get something in his back pocket for q2 like we we saw what happens um even on like soft tires he just couldn't just couldn't get the car switched on with more fuel in the car he, he obviously you know did a wee bit better but it wasn't the barn you know the barnstorming like last to first charge that we've seen him do in the past I mean you look at what he did in Brazil last year after starting from was it 10th or thereabouts and he you know he was he was right up there at the sharp end by the very end of it and, and won the race and uh, you know it's a it's it's quite a shame to see him back where he is I and I hope that Mercedes have an idea of what these issues um he's having you know what's causing them um and what's just causing the inconsistency because it's just been a it's been a weird weekend in general qualifying 
was uh, i mean it's probably a good thing i wasn't in on the qualifying show because i i had some some spicy words coming out of my mouth after that it just it made me hate this track even more if i'm honest but um uh, you know, but uh, like just yeah I'm, I'm lost for words i don't i don't really know what to say i mean you pointed out before the drivers he he finished ahead of one had two penalties one was propped uh, you know this time a couple of weeks ago propped up on the couch watching tally having a bagel or something wasn't aware that he was going to be you know brought into you know one race one race weekend let alone two and um you know a driver who got half his side pod ripped off by a uh, a dive bombing uh alexander Albon. so i don't, i don't know I, I i think we need to see more before we draw conclusions but at this stage i'm I'm a bit worried for for Lewis, especially. I mean, this won't do his mental health much good. Like, you know, putting so much effort and so much energy and so much determination into driving that car and coming up 10th. I mean, for somebody who's so used to having every success in the world and, and having some absolute grief thrown at him by just absolute nuffies along the way, like he's... Uh, yeah i mean not to sound daft but hey i hope he's okay because that's that's going to be a bit of a self you know a confidence blow um but more importantly i hope that the team can actually get on top of that because george russell has obviously got i think he's got more of an idea of how to drive the car at this stage we need lewis up the front there as well fighting with ferrari fighting with red bull fighting with his teammate um getting in the way of Fernando Alonso a bit more as well, just for fun as well. Like I want to see him up the front. Lewis finishing 10th is not where Lewis wants or needs to finish. And it's just, um, yeah, it's a bit strange. I'm not a Lewis Hamilton fan per se. Like I, I, th- I think the guy is an incredible driver and he is, you know, without a doubt the, you know, the greatest driver we've, we've ever seen in formula one, but I, I just happen to, you know, support other drivers regardless of that that's just that's just strange that was the way i think that's been not the weirdest thing for me this weekend not by a long shot but it was definitely an anomalous result that i hope we don't see a repeat of but at the same time i have concerns yeah it, it's definitely concerning for sure i mean it seemed as though in bahrain that the car was all right for both the drivers just was not the fastest but this weekend, Russell, you know, he got on top of the car and Hamilton didn't seem that far off him until qualifying, but qualifying, he just could not hook it up. He said it was literally undrivable, which is extremely concerning when, you know, a guy of Hamilton's experience and, and success is saying things like that about your car, that that's a big problem. And that's not an easy fix. You know, it's easy to say, oh, you should have gone with a different setup, but you know, they would have tried out so many of them and, for some reason, it, it just did not pay off. But it happens. It happens to the best of them. He had some disappointments last year as well. Baku being one of them, of course. So, you know, we can, he can move on from that. He'll he'll regroup for Australia in two weeks' time and he'll hope, be hoping for a lot better. Um, but we'll move on to the guy who finished 11th today, uh, Zhou Guan Yu. Uh, Phil, you know, I, you know, I really do feel for him. I didn't actually see the incident where he ended up getting a penalty for gaining the advantage off the track. But as soon as they showed the replay of him in the pits taking his stop go, I knew that's it. They're going to give him another penalty because you can't touch the car. Even the Jackman cannot tr- touch the car. And you just knew he was going to have to come in again. And it ended up ruining his race. Yeah. And uh, you consider last week, George, how he ran and, gets points and he was right there on the edge of getting points again. Um, They were not as pacey um, this weekend uh, per se as they were last weekend, but you know, to be right there at the edge of the points and with two penalties and be within what did it work out to be um, nine seconds or whatever of, of a seven time world champion. Yeah. I mean, it's, it it's, Thanks for, for Zhou Guan Yu in that sense. Uh, Alpha's day kind of went uh, went into the dumper when Botas's car quit. But the the, the notion is it, it, it kind of goes the same way as Kevin Magnuson. I look at it in the same ways for Haas and Kevin Magnuson. He's finished 10th and 11th. He's finished both races this year. You have guys who have way more experience that have been making mistakes and crashing 
Um, you have guys, you have mul- you have uh, mechanical issues that have taken guys out. But this rookie who has got a lot of attention on him, you know, some good, some bad, whatever it may be, is going out there and doing what he has to do. And at a track that is one of the worst tracks on the history of planet Earth and would be a likely scenario for him to go and bin it, he didn't. Um, yeah, mistakes were made. Yes, things happen. But finished the Grand Prix, was on the lead lap, and gets experience going to other circuits that now he'll have more experience at in general uh, from his time in F in in Formula 2 and Formula 3. And we'll see what the Sauber team will be able to bring to the table at some of those races. Um, actually, Australia won't be one of those, uh, unfortunately for him, but uh, it will be at uh, Imola after that and some of the other ones, and then so there will be a couple new circuits. So it'll actually give him an opportunity to kind of be on the front foot in that sense. I Unfortunate things happen, bad luck, but I think for what that day went, how the day went for his teammate and for a lot of other guys, I think getting a finish was a win in, in its own right for Zhou Guan Yu uh, in only a second start. Yeah, impressive from uh, from Guan Yu for sure. I mean, you know, he actually, like you said, he finished the race. A lot of guys didn't manage to do that, whether it was mechanical issues or crashing out. So fair play to the guy. You know, he had more points are on the horizon for him because Alfa Romeo do have a fast car. They should have scored points today, but fortunately, unfortunately, Valtteri Bottas ended up retiring with uh, overheating issues. Um, and we'll, we'll cover the last two finishers in this race, both Aston Martins, uh, Nico Hulkenberg in 12th, uh, Lance Stroll in 13th. Stroll actually looked like he might have got points today, um, but he ended up, uh, ended up getting getting hit by Alexander Albon. And I think you, you mentioned it before, Steve. Where, where do you stand on that incident? Do you think that it was Albon going for a lunge that wasn't really on, or was it Stroll cutting the, uh, shutting the door? Because it's a very tricky corner, that one. It's very tricky to run to right through there. Yeah, there's not really... I mean, there's really only one racing line into that corner. I think I would put it down to a racing incident. Um, I think Albon was very ambitious, just sending it, you know, sending it up the inside. But um, at the same time, Lance Stroll left the door a wee bit open, probably realized half a second too late, and then immediately went to close it, and they just came together. So I I wouldn't necessarily expect anything to come off that in, in the way of penalties or that sort of thing. But I think racing incident but i'd put a wee bit more weight of blame towards albon if i'm honest just purely because um you know i it it didn't look like he was going to make the corner anyway but at the same time stroll saw him or you know that he would have been aware that um albon was there um he he was sort of defending kind of half-heartedly and then and then sort of shut the door so um yeah, bit of a bit of a not an odd coming together, but probably a bit amateur considering they've both been doing this for for a wee while now. I mean, Albon's obviously been out of Formula One for a year, but um, he knows what he's doing, and he should probably know a wee bit better than that. And Stroll should know better than to leave the door open and then sort of change his mind. I mean, he didn't move under braking, but he did the next worst thing, which is just sort of you know closing the door on somebody who had you know who, who had half the car up the inside of them so um yeah they can argue about that all day um, you know whether they bury the hatch on on that incident or not is entirely up to those two but i yeah i'd i'd say racing incident to move on um yeah not not a good look but it happens yeah, it's just one of the things. It was the last few laps. They had nothing to lose. Albon went for it. Stroll probably didn't see him coming. Ended up crashing. Stroll finished. He finished a lap down. Uh, Albon ended up retiring from the race. Classified 14th, though, the last classified uh, guy in the race. Uh, and we'll, we'll move on to uh, Valtteri Bottas. He, he was the third of three drivers within about three laps to have the exact same problem of overheating and and ended up uh, retiring from the race. But Phil, it, it was a great weekend for him, a good qualifying for him. He was, would have been on for very solid points and he probably would have got about six today. He was really challenging the Alpines, but unfortunately the car just didn't make it to the finish. Yeah, and that's the thing. We just talked about it with his teammate. If, uh, if I mean, you look at Botas so far this year, 
seems like whatever version of him it is now he seems re-energized and he, and, and he seems like it's he the freedom of being in this team and being the leader of this team obviously and i guess the relationships he has built so far he seems very in tune not only with the car but the team and it kind of looks like what valtteri botas looked like uh circa 2013 14 around the or 14 15 era when the williams was actually up there uh, essentially as like the third best team with him and massa as, as a as a driver duo and and that's where the you know all the the momentum of where he's going to become him he could be in a top team came from this is what a lot of people expected when he went to mercedes it didn't really come off more years than not but it's it's unfortunate i think it's part of what i think steve said it. i think tom said it so far during the show that with the power unit situation and also with the fuel changes and some of the other aspects that are going on it's going to happen i mean you're talking about one of the hotter races they're probably going to end up going to this year even though they're running it in the middle of the night um so unfortunate hopefully not massive damage massive issues so that it affects them in regards to their power unit components but up to that point botas had had a great weekend as you said george and you know he's running a lot better and he looks a lot better and he would have <laughs> he would have beaten lewis uh today which would have been funny uh for a lot of people and um we wouldn't have been saying that last year from Sauber either. Sauber, Alpha Sauber, uh, they were basically right just ahead of the Haas last year. So, you know, now the Ferrari power unit's much better. These teams have built better race cars. Now they're up there contending, and I figure as the season goes on, they'll be able to continue in that midfield fight, which is a positive. They're, the midfield fight now is between Alpine and all these Ferrari, the two Ferrari teams, and I guess Alpha Tori, and then the back end is the, and maybe McLaren, I guess, and then the back end are two Mercedes teams now, instead of what it was last year, two Ferrari teams. Yeah, the order has definitely shifted around. The Ferrari teams going up, the the Honda, well, sorry, I should say the Red Bull powertrain uh, and the Renault engine cars staying about the same, and the Mercedes engine cars have all plummeted, really. Uh, only only Mercedes constructors, Mercedes have really, you know, kind of kept up there. McLaren maybe as well, but like, that remains to be seen. Um, but yeah, uh, I mentioned him a bit, a bit before. Um, Fernando Alonso, another, I know, another guy who suffered a mechanical failure today, overheating again. I think it said a cool engine or something like that on his on his dashboard. But by then it was already too late. But Steve, it was positive for him. He did eventually, you know, he overtook his teammate. He was running up there. He was, it would have been an interesting battle between him and Hamilton, I'm sure, if they ended up fighting on track. But uh, disappointing from him. Um, he, he would have been up there, like I said, but it, it's concerning that, that the Alpine has retired from that. He's, I think he's going to be a very angry man after that. This is fine. This is all part of L plan. <laughs> it's fine. Don't panic. No, I don't. <laughs> I felt really bad for him. He was like, he is my driver of the day. Um, that uh, that fight with uh, with Ocon was just was awesome. They they kept it clean, but it was an absolute knife fight. Like it was it was very very. Um, uh, I say clean. They didn't hit each other, um, but it was very much the the sort of you know fighty scrappy Fernando Alonso we saw. I mean, way back in you know, when he started in F1 and, in, uh, in, you know, with Minardi, um, he was, you know, wily then. He's obviously just got a much more mature head on his shoulders now. And it's it's quite interesting watching him sort of line up these overtakes and that sort of thing, because it, it almost comes from nowhere, but it's just, it's classic Fernando. Um, and then for his car to lunch itself because of, uh, you know, just, just, you know overheating um was a real shame he you know walking back to the pits he was beating his uh hands against his against his helmet and i saw a couple of comments from people on social media just like, oh it's not a good look for him to do that it's like, well no he's probably got the most competitive car he's had in recent formula one history when he's you know when he's been involved um 
only for it to sort of you know give up halfway through it's quite quite sad um and again it's I, I, you know there are a few unknowns with these new cars with um you know the the very different cooling arrangements they've got with this new e10 fuel which produces a fair bit more heat um and just the the very different cooling arrangement that alpine apparently have um i hope it's i hope this isn't going to be a trend i you know all of these things that have occurred in the last two races are, are, are still anomalous because we we don't have a massive pool of data to, to to look at from from over a season or two so um yeah it's again one of those things that it's it, it's unfortunate i hope it's not a trend it is still a reno power unit in the back of that car at the end of the day so uh, i've i'm i've always held a bit of skepticism for Reno and now Alpine because they they say one thing that you know that they want to go for, you know winning championships and that sort of thing and that's all well and good but saying and doing are two different things and when you give your uh in my opinion when you give your potentially better driver a package that isn't necessarily reliable you know they're they're going to start getting frustrated and you know we've seen what happens when Fernando gets a uh, tired and worn out and frustrated of a of a car with a with a poor performing uh power, power unit he quits um and then you have to go find another fernando alonso and that's quite hard uh because fernando alonso is you know you can't replicate that sort of driver he's um he's very unique and he's very good um so i i yeah i was really keen to see where he ended up today i think he you know he did he did I, uh, that car's not red bull or ferrari fast but it's I kind of get the impression that it's sort of you know they could start giving Mercedes a real headache if they you know keep up this performance without you know throwing literal or figurative spanners in the engine so um once we get to the more temperate climates and that sort of thing where overheating may not be so much of an issue I think Alpine might be kind of scary that's my impression it's definitely possible. I think if any team can really challenge Mercedes for third place this year in the constructors, Alpine are the most likely to do it, in my opinion. Um, they just gotta they just gotta keep the reliability going. Um, and it wasn't too great today with that. But every single engine supplier had one retirement today. Red Bull had one retirement, Mercedes had one retirement. Ferrari had one with Tyron and, and, and Renault had one with Chiman as well. So it was kind of evenly spread. So it wasn't an engine specific thing. All the engines struggled today to end, uh, get to the end of the race. And unfortunately, the Mercedes power retirement was Daniel Ricciardo, uh, Phil. And seeing where Lando Norris finished up in, in seventh, you know, Ricciardo easily could have been eighth. He could have easily been in that battle. And, you know, fair play to him. His qualifying was decent just behind Norris. He was just behind Norris in the race. He, he seems to have really closed the gap between he and his teammate this season. Which is a positive sign, George. I mean, yes, he did win the Italian Grand Prix, but it was kind of a nightmare season for Daniel Ricciardo. Last year, um, last weekend's race was definitely <laughs> not one of his best. Uh, probably gave him reminders of driving uh, uh whatever that car was that he had to debut in his... The HRT. <laughs> uh, Hispania racing team um, toilet on wheels, and, and he was in, couldn't even get into Q2. Um, you know, now, I mean, you look at it, it's like what Steve was talking about with, I mean, to a, to a much lesser extent because he hasn't won a world championship, but he's won Grand Prix. You know, you lose one of the characters in this sport you know, if Daniel Ricardo decides to like go and bag it and go to America or something, follow his NASCAR dream or follow IndyCar or do something like that's kind of what we're leading to because McLaren between whether it's Colton Herta or Paddle Award or insert other driver here, ha they're looking, they're looking at the future because they already got one of their drivers. Um, you want to see him run well. And he had a decent enough car. Looked like he was going to be able to contend for points. Since Lando got points, you would have, like you're saying, you would have assumed that uh, Ricardo would have been able to be there too. Uh, engine went and quit on him. Overheating issues, which is you know what we're talking about. A lot of these outside of who we're about to mention here in a moment. Um, 
the, the fact of the matter is that it, it's been a rough start to the year, but I think for Ricardo going back home, finally to race at home for the first time in a few years, probably will be good energy. He'll take solace in the fact that they had a little bit more pace this weekend. And I think he'll be able to kind of forget about this weekend and how it ended um, based on whatever they get to, whatever data they're able to take away from this and kind of look forward and say, hey, it's my home Grand Prix. get to race for the first time in three years. Let's see what happens here and pro- try to put a points scoring, get a, a points result at uh, Melbourne here in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, to kind of get himself settled and, and started in his 2022 championship. Yeah, it, it'd be great. It'd be great for him to go back and, and race in Australia. I'd be, I'm really looking forward to it. No, I don't think any Australian driver has any, ever finished on the podium in the Formula One, um, Formula One Australian Grand Prix era. Uh, I don't expect that to change this year, but I do expect Ricardo to be up there solidly in the points. It just needs to get to the finish. And like Steve mentioned, when we get to the cooler climates, which Australia should be a bit of a cooler race, it can be quite hot there, obviously, but I think it'd be cooler than what we've experienced here in Jeddah this weekend. Uh, it should mean that the cars are more reliable. So it'd be very interesting to see how he gets on there, roared by the own crowd. The first race there in three years for Australia. It's been a very long time coming. Um, but yeah, unfortunate for Ricardo today. Unfortunate for... Yuki Tsunoda as well. He didn't even start the race, uh, as did uh, as did not Mike, uh, Mick Schumacher either. Obviously, he had his horrific accident in qualifying. The speed that he carried into that barrier was uh, was terrifying, to be honest with you. Um, thankfully, though, he he was somehow okay after that. I don't even know how. I thought he would have had a concussion after that. If anybody who's not seen that uh, crash, um, go back and watch it because it's a huge one. But thankfully, he's all right. Um, he would have been fit to race today, but it's just that Haas did not want to waste another another chassis if they uh, if he, if one of the drivers crashed again as well. So uh, thankfully he's all right. He'll be back for Australia. Um, Nicholas Latifi though, absolutely dismal start to the season. Crashed out today and fourteen laps. Obviously he caused the safety car that really kicked the race into overdrive and helped some drivers and hindered other drivers. But yeah. Really, really poor starts this season from Latifi. I have to admit, I, I, I do defend him sometimes, but he needs to he needs to get better. Basically, I mean, Albon also crashed out today, but Latifi did it by himself. So um, that's my little rant on Latifi. Um, Two crashes this weekend. Yeah, he crashed in qualifying as well. I forgot he brought out the first red red flag in qualifying. So he's bringing a lot of money to that team, but he's costing them quite a bit in, in repairs and parts. Um, so some might say he's breaking even. <laughs> cancel himself uh, out yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. I found that that crash he had in the race was quite strange because he said on the radio I, I have no idea what happened there I said, well, well I do you put the power on too early and you found Verstappen's wall from last year it was plainly obvious it was really obvious what happened <laughs> like god honestly yeah so he's got to, he's got to improve he's got to pull, pull his finger out basically that's, uh, that's not good enough for anybody so uh, but yeah, so we'll, fo- we'll we've gone for all the drivers now. Let's focus on the positive. Let's focus on our driver of the day. I don't know who got driver of the day today. I had to drive drive back home straight after the race Leclerc. finished. It was Charles Leclerc. Not a surprise. He did a great job today. Uh, didn't get the win in the end. But I'm I'm going to get. I mean, I'm probably biased with this because McLaren are my favorite team and L- Norris is one of my favorite drivers. But I'm going to go with Lando Norris. I think he did an excellent job today. He was very unlucky not to get sixth in the end. He the improvement on from McLaren in a week's time. Is, is very marked. Obviously, that's also to do with setup and the track, but I think today he did an excellent job and, yeah, could have easily got two more points on top of the six that he already got. So McLaren, points on the board, so they're, they're, off, uh, they're, they're, off, they're off the mark. So, uh, Phil, who's your pick for driver of the day? I'll go with the guy he battled. I'll go with Esteban Ocon, uh, battling your much more seasoned and much harried about teammate. Um, going and being able to beat him in a head-up battle before, you know, the Renault went. The fact of the matter is, Ocon has, in this last few months, all of a sudden turned his career from being somebody who is more famous for some of his incidents and some of the bad, and now he's really, you know, the future of that organization and, um, I mean, yes, they have other junior drivers, and I figure there's at least one that's going to be in a car next year. 
with him uh, as a teammate, but he's he's setting himself up very well, and and he and he's handling himself very well too. Not only with media, but also in the car. So, it, I, I think for this race, the way he he did, he drove, and uh, in general, what I think the rest of this season holds for him, I think is a very positive sign for Esteban Ocon. Um, based on you know what he what it was a few year, like even a year ago at this time what was going on so I'll give it to Esteban Ocon for this week. Yeah, Ocon is really surprising a lot of people, myself included. He's showing a level of performance that I don't think a lot of people thought he was capable of, and uh, it would be very interesting to see how he goes for the rest of the season against his uh, much more illustrious teammate Fernando Alonso. Um, Steve, who's your driver of the day today? Oh, it's Fernando. I think you did say that earlier, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was just awesome. He um yeah, I I think he's um I've always viewed him as an, as incredibly aggressive but very calculating in the way he actually conducts his, you know, on track, you know, um passing shenanigans, whatever you want to call them. Um he 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 seems to be quite comfortable to just sort of sit back and watch what the other guy's doing for a couple of laps. He do, he basically does what Valentino Rossi does. He'll be quite happy to just sit there and, you know, take as long as he needs to, to figure out where a driver's, you know, stronger, where they're weaker. He figured out that Ocon was breaking a wee bit earlier into T1 than, you know, than he was. And he was able to just sort of, you know, it, it was quite funny watching him just sort of back out of those, um, those pass attempts at the, at the final corner. Cause he, he knew that if he just sort of squared the car up and just, you know, gave it full beans, he, he'd have, you know, a good, at least a couple of kilometers an hour on him, which is more than enough to, you know, um, you know stay behind him, uh, stay behind Icon, I should say. And, um, you know, just use DRS and just that extra bit of grunt that he, uh, that he, that he uh, introduced at the beginning of the run down the straight. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was classic Fernando. I really enjoyed it and it's a shame he didn't finish, but, um, he will get my pity vote and driver of the day. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, he did, like you said, he didn't do anything wrong himself. It's just unfortunate he didn't finish the race because of his car lightning down. Um, yeah, it's typically all three of us have not gone for the guy who actually will drive of the day, but you know, we, we offer, we offer alternative views on formula one here on the grid talk podcast. That's just, that's just the way they, that we are. I think if Tom, uh, Tom's had to drop off for a moment, just so he had to tend to something. I, I think he would have gone for Verstappen. just a little hunch. He might've gone for Max Verstappen there for driver of the day, but I'll, I'll let him correct me if he comes back on before we finish this session. Um, so, I, so yeah, uh, let's, let's go and plug our outlets. So, uh, Phil, tell us about the GSP and where people can find it. Yeah, we can find the grits for podcast, basically anywhere you can get podcasts. Uh, we're at grip strip pod on Twitter. We're on, uh, YouTube now we're uploading our, our shows now as well. So you can watch a video if you really want to go and sit there and do that. Um, I, and it's really my my thing is I I guess you listen to it, but you know, if you really want to look at mine and uh, Josh's mugs, then yeah, you can go and watch the show too. Uh, 106 episodes in, and, and uh, we'll be back for episode 107 this week, uh, talking about this race amongst other other racing, NASCAR, and and other series that are going on right now. So um, we talk about all different motorsports. We don't. Uh, we do Formula One, NASCAR, IndyCar, sports cars, motorcycle racing. Basically, if it goes fast, we try to talk about it on the Grip Strip Podcast. So um, if you want to follow me, I'm at Philip G. Matthew on Twitter. If you want to follow Josh, he's JP Huffine. And uh, thanks as always, George, uh, for uh, having us on here on the Grid Talk Podcast. Always cool to talk to other passionate racing fans. Um, about this sport that's been uh, so great to all of us yeah absolutely definitely check out phil's show and uh yeah always always great having you on on, on grid talk it's always good to get the opinions uh so steve i mentioned that you're a part of formula shakedown what is that and where can people find it you can find us on facebook nice and easy um so just look up formula shakedown uh got uh, i think we're sort of up around the four and a half five thousand members right now i really should know this i'm very sorry 
awfully prepared today but there's a lot of us um and it's basically the place you want to go to if you love formula one or anything open wheel uh so we do the support series um uh all the sort of you know european uh asian american regional series as well s5000 which is just awesome um so just anything open wheel really um but it's where you want to go if you love that sort of thing but you don't like the muppets on social media who love it when drivers get hurt or you know just basically like just being knobs really so come visit come hang out uh but if you're one of those people who likes throwing shade at others on social media for liking a driver that you don't then uh don't bother because um i'll have to remove you because you'll probably at yourself sooner rather than later but that's us run over <laughs> Yeah, it's the uh, it's the most wholesome community of Formula One fans and motorsport fans on Facebook. I think that's a good way to describe it because there's definitely a lot of toxicity out there um, and you'll do very well to remove yourself from it. But going to there is a good way to do it. Uh, I will mention as well, I mean, obviously Tom has left the session temporarily because of this, but I will mention that Tom is part of everything F1 and they've got a podcast as well. So definitely check those guys out. Search them up on Facebook or the usual podcast platforms you can find them. And if you want to check out more from us, you can head over to our Facebook page, F1 Chronicle. Like us on there. Follow us on Twitter as well, at F1 Chronicle. We, sh- we tell you when we go out live because obviously we go out live about an hour or so after the event finishes. And yes, we are planning to do that for Australia, despite it being really early in the morning here for for the UK because people like Steve will be up in the middle of the day. So we have to do it across the board. We have to make it consistent. I bet you really look forward to that, aren't you, Steve? Mid-afternoon F1. I can have a beer. I can have as many chips as I want. I don't have to live off coffee. It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have to be a Monday morning racer anymore. So definitely a big improvement there. Um, but yeah, check us out on YouTube as well. If you're listening to us live on the live stream, thank you. But yeah, for those who don't know, you can go over to our YouTube page at uh, f1 grid talk and you can find us there and yeah we can you can join the live chat as well ask us a question and we will uh, answer it after the show uh we're on the usual podcasting platforms as well so spotify apple amazon music verbal omni studio podcast and the f1 critical website just search for f1 grid talk and all of those you'll be able to find our big catalog of shows as well because we've got we've got we've got well we're getting towards nearly 200 now it's it's getting incredible and of course with the f1 firesides as well i believe there'll be one of those coming out uh, midweek this week coming up but if not we will be back at the weekend uh, to preview the australian grand prix so thank you lads for joining us i really do appreciate it as always thanking you absolutely thank you and yet we'll see what the land down under has to offer for formula one first time going there in three years i can't wait we'll see you for that one thank you for joining us go and goodbye there we go so Let's get into some of the questions because I've seen there's a lot of comments on the live stream as usual, which is always good to see. Hey, Phil, if you, uh, well, actually both, if you want to get into technicalities, we have had an Australian on the podium at, uh, at the Aussie GP. It was 2002 when Mark Webber finished. Oh, fifth come on. And they let him up on the podium. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Yeah, I mean, that. it's <laughs> true. It's true. I mean, then you can count anybody that's that's been up as like a team personnel person to get the constructors trophy. I don't think there has been. Oh uh, god, uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. No. no. Yeah, I mean, technically, Daniel Ricciardo was on the podium in yeah. 2014. Yeah, count, didn't count in the end, so <laughs> you could use that one as well. Oh god, let's have a look. So. God, so <laughs> some of the comments in here, I won't even, I won't even read that one out. Uh, Tom Horrocks, one of our usual panelists and uh, host of the Fireside series, has put, "What's your opinion on Joe so far? Showed real lack of experience today, and the team really didn't help, but seems to be showing decent speed." Um, I don't know about lack of experience. I mean, it, it was the team that was showing a bit of lack of experience, like trying to jack his car up when they can't touch it because he's having a <laughs> you penalty. Can't I mean, touch that's the car when he's serving a penalty. Yeah, exactly yeah. his um so his off track excursion i think was was a classic turn one moment where he just you know ran way too deep and and didn't give the place back in time that's his fault that happens but we we've seen everyone like do that at some point in the last two that well the, you know in both instances of us racing at the human rights violation grand prix part two um so yeah it's a it's 
it's not a uh, it's not a rookie mistake. It's just a mistake that you know plenty of people have made. The rookie era was the team. That's just that's just that's just rubbish. Come on, do better. It's not hard. Mm. I mean, it's pretty hard, but it's not it's not that hard to know to not touch the car for five bloody seconds when it enters the box. So just leave it alone. Yeah, that, that cooked his race. Um, but uh, as for the question, I think he's doing really well. Um, he hasn't synoded it, you know, like yeah. scored points in his first race and then snapped the car in half in the second. So um, that's, you know, it's a good start. I, I like him. He, he, he seems to have a pretty mature head on his shoulders for his age um he's not at Bottas's level but you wouldn't expect that but um yeah car's quick he's making the most out of it in his first season so far um it's just yeah unfortunate that this race has uh sort of gone a wee bit sideways and half is that's partly his fault but most of that is his team just completely ballsing up that penalty yeah I can agree <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's very very amateurish for me for sure a lot of debate in the comments about uh, Hamilton being past his peak and you know him being quote unquote too old for F1 and stuff like that and I, I don't know I don't know he's 37 I but I mean you look at they were in the 40s and stuff like Alan Jones came back mm-hmm. after being retired Nigel Nansel was in his 40s when he won his world championship I mean uh, what is it Prost was I think 40 when he won or 40 the late summer, 30s at 39, least yeah 39 to 41 or whatever when he won his last world championship i mean the reality of the world is it's not about age is why he's off um he came back very motivated this year after what went down last year they're not there right now okay but the fact of the matter is mercedes is going to respond how much can they respond we don't know but he's motivated. He has a teammate that, I mean, theoretically is the future of the team. He's going to run a couple, probably a couple more years, I would assume. Um, he's going to see this through. I, it, it feels a lot like 2009 after they won that world championship in 2008 at McLaren. They weren't able to really respond to those new technical regulations. And they were out to lunch early part of the season. By the summer, they started to figure it out and they started to come back up there and compete. Does that mean he's going to win a world championship? Probably not. Does that mean he could go back and win a race or two? Yes. And Hmm. as long as he wins one race, he continues his streak of every year of winning a race. Do I think he's going to win on pole this year? Probably not. Um, But I think it's more likely with the way things are, um, with all the issues teams are having, that it's more likely that he could win a race at a, a you know, a tighter circuit, a la Hungary, um, than you know, and and kind of make something of this situation. He's not washed up. He's, I mean, the the notion of him being done. I mean, it, I guess your the comparison would be, oh, it's Valentino Rossi, but the fact of the matter because he has the day glow yellow numbers and everything on there. So he's looking kind of like what Rossi looked like for like the last four years of his career. It's not the same thing, uh, honestly. I think um, the car, he can figure out the car. He will figure out this deal out. He's not going to be out to lunch the whole year um, because George is able to kind of get around this car. I think that means he knows he has to do some work on his end. And it's similar to last year. Um, They were not at the best for a good part of the year. But they figured it out in the end, and by God, he should have been number eight. But you know, it the the fact is, there's a reason why he's one of the best. He will figure it out, and that team will figure it out. Um, he's not done. Yeah, Definitely. I think I think something else to consider is that George Russell is quite used to having a car that is, you know possibly underperforming and he can just drive around the problem Mm, um whereas lewis will possibly be a wee bit more sensitive to you know poor setup changes or just just general lack of optimization um yeah phil phil's basically you know like i'll let you i'll I'll echo very quickly what uh what phil said he's not washed up um this is a car and driver sport it always has been the people who say it's just the car or if you put i mean you could you could put like you know even if you put lewis in a house 
no, wait, not a Haas, because they're actually doing quite well. If you put him in like a Williams um, or an Aston Martin or something like that, he's still going to be not up the front, but that's just because yeah. the car has limitations. You get to a point where you start overdriving to the point of it just being frankly dangerous um, and stupid. And I mean, mm. he's got he's got a very mature head on his shoulders. He's not going to put himself in, in harm's way if he knows that there are ways to set up the car um, in, a, in a far more sort of, you know, um, far more sensible way. It's we're two races into the season calling him washed up is, is just, it's a, it's very much a knee jerk sort of reaction comment to just a, what I think is anomalous. I think that they'll, they'll sort this out sooner rather than later. Yeah. After he got a podium last week too, and he was going to finish uh, yeah. fifth, uh, he would have finished the same spot that George Russell finished. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, so... the thing that annoyed me with that was people were saying, Oh, he just capitalized on Red Bull's sort of bad luck. Well, well yeah, he has to. Yeah. Like capitalizing on somebody else's misfortune. Everybody is a did. Everybody of, in the field yeah, did, apart from Ferrari. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's one of those things that happen. It's like um, you know, it's like when uh, when I can't remember which which Toyota it was a few years ago at Le Mans. Um, the I think it's, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the Toyotas failed or started to fail on the last lap. Nice and the other lap. Toyota took the lead and and won the race. That's not. Like that doesn't take away from the fact that that second place car suddenly became first and then won the 24 hours. They have to be there in the first place to capitalize on that situation. Like it's just, yeah, you're always going to have those sort of misfortunate, those, those episodes of misfortune around you. And it's up to you and the team to capitalize on, on those mistakes or whatever it might be that 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 leads you to exploiting that to that that position um so you know they've done everything they can um and yeah like i said i think mercedes will figure this out fairly soon if they are probably the team to reference for innovation and new ideas and and that sort of thing in, in recent formula and history so yeah they'll be fine it might not be melbourne but it'll it'll be soon yeah, they'll they'll get it eventually for sure. And yeah, it's it's just ridiculous to say that Hamilton's <laughs> Hamilton's done. Everybody was you know singing his praises. Oh, he's got another podium. And it was it was a great drag down here only in Bahrain, but you know it could turn around very quickly and it could turn back around again to be positive very soon as well. I've got no doubt about that. Um, I'll just get a few more questions in because I'm getting quite tired now. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Um, so Jared Bradley's put, thank you, Jared. You put a lot of comments on here. You're always active on the live chat. It's fantastic to see. He's put on a scale of one to 23, where do we rank the Jeddah track and how many more non-current, uh, well, he's put tacos. I'm guessing he meant to put track. That's also correct. Screw, uh, screwed you over there. How many non-current tracks are better than it? Um, well, I mean, there's only 22 confirmed uh, tracks this year, but I think it's fair to say that this would still probably be 23 to be honest i mean the only one that was worse than it for me was sochi and that's gone now so yeah i can't yeah, i can't think of one that's worse than it yeah this is the worst this is one of the worst racetracks i've ever seen in my life um and it, and, it, and it doesn't even take into account the the rights out stuff and all the other yeah. you know and the nonsense that they were going through this weekend um prior to this race i mean it, it it's it's been a totally farcical exercise. They're supposedly making a permanent circuit. Um, if if Liberty Media had any real awareness um, and logic behind them, they would wait until the permanent circuit comes along instead of trying to go and get somebody seriously injured there, uh, which, you know, Mick Schumacher's had three, two massive crashes there in a span of a few months. He had a huge crash during the race last year, which changed the race in, in last year's race. He had a huge crash in qualifying. And, I mean, there was other crashes during these two weekends. And it's like, what do you want? What are you looking for? Um, it's, it's basically a go-kart, overrated go-kart track. Um, and it's, they don't have, it's not safe. Um, it's not, I don't know how you can call it a tier one circuit. There's nothing tier one about it. Mm. Um, yeah. You'll say, well, Monaco's a tier one circuit. Well, the fact is it's Monaco. Um, the notion is it's just, we talked about it on that episode of a few months ago, 
how bad it was, and it's still that bad, if not worse. Whatever adjustments they made to some of these corners did not really make much of a difference in regards to the racing or a safety aspect. It's still an unsafe racetrack. It's still a track that really, under multiple circumstances, doesn't belong. Uh, but I guess we're stuck there, um, unfortunately. But um, I, it, it's it, it, there. There are plenty of tracks around the world that have way better safety standards and could probably put on a better show, but um, they're not going to go there. Or they can't go there. Or the money or whatever. And uh, it is what it is, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of ones for sure. So I've gone safe. I, I just, I, I mean, uh, to, I, 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 I thought when Mick had his crash this weekend, I thought I'd like we uh, just, just everything about that. When I saw the crash, I, I sort of just got up and walked away from the TV. So I thought I'd just watched him, you know. I just thought sort we'd of watch a driver get killed. It gave me, um, it, it, it sort of, it, it had echoes of, um, you know, Roland Ratzenberger's crash in 94, where his head was yeah. just bobbing around in the cockpit and just, you couldn't see him moving. And the, you know, there were no replays or, you know, thank God there were no replays because I fucking hate watching crash. Like any crash you don't want to see, that's, yeah, that that's right up with the, there with the worst. But, um, yeah, like you don't even need to like as Phil pointed out, you don't need to reference the fact that Saudi Arabia has hideous human rights violations, um, is effectively fighting a proxy war in a nation next door that decided to make its presence very well known um, on a on a you know in an incident that I do not think was coincidental at all. I think that was that 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 was very much a very well you know planned in advance for this particular weekend um but you know that's another that discussion could go on for hours but this track's just dangerous um that mm. when they when mick had his crash they said they didn't expect a car to crash there that's i'm just, sorry that's just not a that's, good excuse is it that's just that's no. rub there's no runoffs here like there are a couple admittedly in the in the in the high braking zones and that sort of thing but not expecting a car to you know lose you know lose the rear like it did um because it was turn uh, i think lost it in turn 10 turn 10 collected it on the outside of turn 11 and then in the the car sort of ended, ended up, up turn, 12, turn 12, 12 or you know the just past the apex of turn 12 yeah. that's um that's a good that's a good you know couple of hundred meters that that car's traveled after impact that just a yeah, and it snapped in half. I mean, there's a lot of energy in that in, in that crash. The uh, G suit, the sensor in the suit recorded 33 G on impact, which for you know that that might not sound like a lot. That's a lot. That's that's a concerning amount of, oh, yeah. uh, of force. But just the fact that there was absolutely no, that, you know, that no tech pro barriers, nothing there to try and absorb the impact. It was just concrete. Um, thank god these cars are as safe as they are otherwise i think we would be talking about you know we we'd be potentially talking about a seriously hurt or dead driver um it doesn't matter who it is i mean the fact that it's michael schumacher's son i mean that family's had so much tragedy the last few years with what's happened to his dad i mean take that out of the equation it doesn't matter who it is any dead driver is is is, or seriously injured driver is just horrific so um yeah we need to go someplace else anywhere else um just not here like the the go-kart track that my dad fucking dug up for me in our backyard when i was like six or seven years old would be safer than this like or better than this it's just yeah i don't rate it at all and yeah i'm glad the weekend's over to be honest so, you know the race racing's great and all but you could get that at most of the circuits we'll be going to this season it doesn't it doesn't need to be here no, I, I completely agree with both of you guys, what you said. Um, I mean, they are, I mean, it's, it's terrible that we are going to Saudi Arabia, in my opinion. I think I just don't think we should go there, but money talks, we all know that. However, you have if you have unlimited money like this, like they do, they should be able to design a good track. And I hope that that's the last we've seen of it. I hope that, that we, if we are going to keep the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, which it appears we're going to do for the next 10 years or whatever it's going to be, that we go to a new track that's, you know, purpose-built, properly purpose-built. I mean, this was purpose-built in a sense. Uh, it's a street track, so it's not not really, but you know what I mean? It's 
yeah, I hope we go to somewhere that's just safer because, yeah, it is cool to say, oh, this is the fastest street track in the world. And it is. That is a, that is a nice thing to say, I suppose you could say. But at the end of the day, it's unsafe. Like, Magnussen had a problem at that same corner, I think, where his car just broke, essentially. And, and you know, it's a bit of a prelude of things to come because, you know, Mick, he, you know, he ran over the curb. He, he ran slightly wide, you could say. But to hit the wall like that, you know, any other track, pretty much, even somewhere like Baku or somewhere like that, there is far more runoff. And yeah, like um, like Steve said, to say that they didn't expect a car to crash there, that's that's just, I mean, we're in the post now, so we can say it. You can crash anywhere. It's just bollocks, isn't it? Like you can crash yeah. at any point on the track, and a point where like that where they're going so fast as well, a crash would be very bad. And it turned out to be that way. So I hope it's the last time we see it. Um, but yeah, let's let's just go with one more question. Let me just try and find one. Um, so, so, question. It, another one from Jared. Jared, you've some fantastic questions for all this. I wish I could go through them all. We don't have the time. Uh, last one, though. Uh, is is seven the best McLaren can hope for this season, or can they turn it around with a new aero package? I'm not sure if you're referring to seven in the constructors or seven from the track. I mean, seven... F- at the moment, that kind of, around that kind of area on the track, I'd say that's probably the best they can hope for realistically. Um, in terms of the constructors, I mean, if you have a look at it, they're around that. I mean, they're in that. They're in that kind of group: Alpine, Haas, Alfa Romeo, Alfa Tauri, McLaren. Them five cars, from fourth down to eighth. Those five, those five teams. Um, it's very close. McLaren could be at the top of it. McLaren could be at the back of it. If I had to stick money on it, though, I don't think they'd beat Alpine. Alfa Romeo, not quite consistent enough. Alfa Tauri, not quite consistent enough. I could see McLaren getting fifth this year, but I think fourth would be a very big ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd, I think McLaren's bigger problem is just the, the there's, there's evidence gathering with the results we're seeing that well, just Mercedes um, or HPP may have missed the boat a little with, uh, with the E10 or with the introduction of E10. Um, the, like the, the bottom, I think, five cars in the standings are all Mercedes power units. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, bo- it's <laughs> both Williams, both Aston, but it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, that's the bigger problem because these power units are going to be basically under lock and key uh, by September, I think, when the second phase of the freeze kicks in. So part one's already done. That's the that's the internal combustion engine, turbo, that sort of thing. And then the next stage is the battery and the MGUK and MGUH, I think. Don't quote me on that. But um, they seem to be on the back foot already. I think the fact that Mercedes, like the, the works team are a wee bit further ahead as their car is a very low drag concept. Um, Mercedes haven't gone down that route and I think they are suffering a little. So th- this is, I mean, we've said it so many times before about other teams as well, but for McLaren, this is a make or break season. They have taken a pretty significant backward step in my view. I can't see them getting, I, I mean, I'd be surprised if they even finished fifth in constructors at this stage. If we go off what we've seen so far, there's just some really bizarre inconsistency with that car. And it just doesn't seem to sort of, it seems quite unpredictable. It doesn't look like they can find a good sort of sweet spot in terms of setup. But um, yeah, once we get to a few more established tracks, we'll be able to get a better idea of what's going on. But um yeah, I think, uh, like Andreas Seidel said after um, Bahrain, that, you know, there's th- the pain isn't over, basically. So, um, yeah, it's not not sounding good, but teams are always very good at sort of, you know, fluffing up their uh, low expectations and then blowing everyone out of the water. So, we'll see. Yeah, no, very good points there. I, I think it'd be tough for them to get fifth, but I think it's also possible. We'll see. Long season ahead, 21 races to go. We've only had two of them, so we'll see how it goes. Right, I'm going to call it a night. I'm knackered. <laughs> Not going to lie. Um, but yeah, no, good race. And I, yeah, I really enjoyed that with you guys. Um, yeah, we'll see for the next one. Like I said, uh, we'll be previewing Australia at the weekend. I think Ruby will probably host that because we're not in a 
particular hateful country in a couple of weeks. So yeah, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll uh, yeah we'll we'll arrange all that and uh, yeah. You guys enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your Monday, Steve. And uh, yeah, I'll we'll catch you soon. Nice one. Cheers.